very, very many people <clears throat> do not understand what a prophet does. <clears throat> a prophet is not here to give you your walk with God. They are not here to give you everything you need. They are sent by God to clarify the will of God in your life. You see, every one of you are different. I told you, look at your fingerprints. Every one of you are special. God is the only one that can treat people and make them feel so special that they know that God loves them. But you see, not everyone is wise enough to receive it in the manner that they should. Because some will puff themselves up and boom, go way out of course. <clears throat> some, like Anova, will just shine whoo, real bright and then fizzle out. Because all of their strength and all of their energy is for self is for their purpose, is for what they want, what they think, what they feel. Like he told Peter, I plan, the Satan plans on sifting you like wheat. I don't know if you know what that meant, but I often talk about sifting the will of God, the word of God, and the truth through the flesh. <coughs> That is why it is very important to die to self. Because God comes along, even if you're just gifted with prophetic utterance, meaning you are not a prophet. And God wants to give a message to maybe perhaps your church, because that's probably where you're called. <clears throat> and it's sifted through your flesh. So the message comes upon you, and the flesh is so powerful in you because you won't die. So uprises what you think oh, oh, and, and what you feel. Oh, oh, I, I've just, I've just got to tell this. Oh, oh, because in the back of your mind is the knowledge and understanding. This is something you've never heard before. This is something maybe perhaps no one else heard before. And the flesh rises up and gets all excited. God told it to me. He gave it to me. Oh, he wants. Uh, I've been in the presence of real, true, believing prophets. Not fakes, like a lot of you are. Not those that have prophetic utterance. But understanding that perhaps this one is a prophet in this organization. No further. That's their call. That's where God planted them. Maybe in this family. God will use them prophetically. Maybe it's a big, large, powerful, uh, rich family. And God will use them there, that they're a prophet. Maybe way out somewhere in Timbuktu, where maybe you have 10 people in the city. Or maybe you have 2,000 in a city. And they're a prophet for that particular area. But that doesn't make them a prophet. A prophet is entirely different. You can have prophetic utterance where God may reveal some things to you. And even when he reveals it to you, you corrupt it with your flesh because you refuse to die. You refuse to stop this emotional thing within you. You refuse to stop these thoughts and these feelings that were based on everything that you have ever thought, said, or done from the day you were born. You refuse to give that all up. And in some cases, you don't know how. But in some cases, you've got a pretty good picture and you won't go there. Because there's pleasure in the flesh. There's pleasure. So you want to take God and mix him like this. Just mix him up and manipulate him to serve you instead of you serving him. 
Now, you can believe me if you want to, and you can not believe me if you don't want to. It doesn't matter. I am telling you all kinds of different forms of godliness that deny the power thereof. I am introducing to you some truths that are so uh, so powerful that you, if you paid attention, you could understand how to die to self. Like I said, I've probably got almost a thousand videos now out there. Uh, 989, 999, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> In those videos, and don't ask me why God chose me, because I don't know I never would have chose me. Don't ask me why God did this, because nothing, nothing that I can tell you gives a reason why I was chosen to tell you the truth. Nothing I could say, nothing I've been through, nothing I can tell you that I deserve what God has given me and done for me. Nothing. The only thing I can tell you is Jesus. He did it all. He's the one. He's the one that decided this. He's the one. He's the one that deserves everything. So when I die to myself, subdue the flesh and don't listen to it and listen to his voice. You know, like he said in the word, if you will hear my voice, harden not your hearts as they did in the day of provocation. provocation. You remember how he said that. I'm sure you do. Harden not your hearts. Don't harden your hearts against wrath, against the day of wrath. Because you do not know that it leads you to repentance. Keep your heart pliable by the grace and power of God. Pray above all that you be worthy of the calling that he wants to give you. Pray above all that you don't puff yourself up higher than you ought to be. As many do that. Your perception, your understanding, all is due to the makeup of your mind, your body, and your spirit. All of that has to do with who you are in Christ. And if you do not discover that, you're going to go off into life and God will speak to you and you will become confused. Well, is this God? This is probably just me. Is God talking to me? You know, I can't, I can't tell. I don't know. And should I go in this direction or shouldn't I? But, I, but uh, you know, God knows. I can't tell. Well, if you think for a minute I w wasn't in that condition maybe 35, 40 years ago, you'd be wrong. Because when I found the truth in Christ Jesus, I now know I hear his voice clearly. And my job is to clarify the will of God in your life. Now, how do I do that? Do, do I climb into your thinking and your thoughts and your feelings and, and show you everything and know everything? No, I don't. I do that by a revelation of God, by keeping myself, my thoughts, my feelings, my wants, my needs, my desires, my understanding, keeping that totally and completely dead. So when he speaks to me, Satan can't sift that like wheat and mix it, intermix it with the flesh. So that what comes out of my mouth is already corrupted by what I thought, what I felt, what I understood, what I can see. It is so important not to do that. It is so important. He who, who saves himself, who saves his life, shall lose it. And who, he who, who loses his life shall save it. There's a reason. Pick up your cross and follow me. Every one of you, whether you receive it or believe it, you know when you're wrong. 
You understand when you're wrong. Some of you cover it up with a false pride. Well, I won't go there. A false fear. Because I might make a mistake and God might come down upon me. You don't even realize how awful you make God look. Because none of that is true. That's you. I don't go there because I, I, that one is foolish. I, I'm, I won't be like that foolish one. I'm better than that. I know better. I, I won't. I won't step a foot out in faith. Ooh, no, 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 no. Why, I would never think this, and I would never think that, because, you know, uh, God will respect and love me more if I just don't do anything. And around you, there's one being raped and murdered. Around you, there's one dying. Around you, there's one that's screaming for help. Another one is crying for Jesus Christ for the truth. Around you, everything is falling apart. And yet, you still don't allow God to speak to your heart, to cause you to die so that you could learn how to reach people for Christ and lead them to the only one, the only one that could help them. So you see, you're not the answer. Oh, you grab hold of the truth, hold it in unrighteousness for yourself. Oh, I've got everything. I know everything. I can help. I can, oh yeah, I can. nobody's like me. You can do that if you want to. Like I always say, have at it. And the reason why I say that is because I know the flesh is going to lead you around that mountain and around that mountain and around it. You're going to go around and around and around till you figure out, oh, I got to climb up that hill. And when you get to that hill, you go, oh, I got to find my way to where God wants me. It might occur to you, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. If you don't have the knowledge and understanding of your redemption now, where are you going to find it? Oh, well, I, I, I'm I, good, I'm good. I go to church three times a week. Oh, I serve God, I clean the church, I, 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 I cook in, in everything I, I, I teach even in Sunday school I'm good I'm fine just like that hopeless alcoholic why well, I've known Jesus for years and I've taught Sunday school for years and you're gonna try and tell me that you have just discovered Jesus Christ her husband has to lock up her in the house because she'll get out and go in bars to get men to buy her booze. He's got to lock up the, whatever booze is in the house because she will drink it. He even has to, to lock up the mouthwash because she's so desperate to have the cravings in her body from saturating her body from booze. See, that's how uh, al alcoholics are made. The first ten years of their life, they go out after work or before work or even home. I'm just going to relax here and enjoy myself. Why, I'm just going to take this beer. Why, everybody knows that's not hard liquor. I can't be addicted to beer. Everybody knows that. that's foolish to think that I'm addicted. And every day of your life, you drink at least a case. And you just drink all day long. You get off after work and you, I am entitled to enjoy myself. Look at all the money I made. Look at all that I do for my family. Well, what did you do for your family? Oh, I see. They have a roof over their head. And sometimes they have food on their table. Sometimes you haven't drank, drank it all up. But, oh, you are the man and the woman. 
that does everything. So for every day for 10 years, you go about doing this, saturating your body with booze. Five years down the road, nobody can tell that you're a drunk. Nobody can tell that you do nothing else but drink. You can still walk straight. You're not slurring your words. You're not acting like an idiot. But you know what? After you saturate your body with that alcohol so much that it's filled to the brink and it can't take any more, now you can't hide it anymore. Now you have these horrible cravings because now your body can't live without it and it's no longer a matter of, of choice. Now you see how bad you are. Sometimes you know you're slurring. Sometimes you know you're walking slide sideways, shuffling your feet, sitting on a bar stool, and peeing yourself. But still you're gonna drink. You gotta have that booze. Well, the mentality that started you off ten years before is still in there. You just gotta relax. You just gotta, I can't face the problems at home. I can't face the responsibilities. But, oh, no, I can, I can do this. So you're highly intelligent. And you knew better than to do what you're doing. But you still do it. And as much as I described to you, a drug addict is worse. I'm not talking about the ones that they shoot up with dope to make them addicted, because that happens too. They shoot them up knowing that your body will begin to crave it. They hate you because you don't, you don't, you aren't like them. And so they'll catch you in secret and they'll nail you. But you trust them, they're your buddies. Why, you've known them for 20 years. And one day you fall asleep and they inject you with a real potent drug. And suddenly you can't live without it. Well, the alcoholic is the same way. And, and I really do think that the alcoholic is one of the most selfish diseases that they are. There is. Because they they start out with a free moral agency. They start out willingly choosing it. You know, the freedom of choice is a very big deal. It's like a person, somebody slaps them in the face and they have a choice. They could be offended. They could get angry, smack them back, or they can forgive them and walk away. It's a choice. You can choose to be offended. Walk away, look at your wounds, and I'm so hurt. Look what so-and-so did to me. I don't know what to do. You could do that. Have at it. Destroy your life with offense. Oh, but I didn't offend me. They did it. No, you chose to go that path. You choose these things, and then you blame it on other things or other people. Somebody hurt you real bad, so therefore you make your, up your mind. Like the man who was so ignorant. He loved God, and then when God took his dad, he got mad at God and never went back. How foolish. Destroy yourself because you're not judge. You don't know what's ahead. You don't know why God took him. Sometimes God takes people out of this world, and I will say this like my daughter, to save them from what's to come. But you don't like that. You're, hey, you're God. You don't like that at all. Well, I don't know how I got on this subject about, about alcoholism. But you keep on drinking, and it starts to eat your brain cells. You keep on drugging it, it starts to eat everything up, depending on what you are on. Like, I've met many of them that start out with marijuana. And then they begin to lie to their parents. Well, I'm just smoking weed. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on that hard stuff. And all the time, they're on cocaine. All the time. 
And then one day somebody breaks into the house and they steal the big TV. They get a hold of the records of their uh, checks and everything and they max out the charge cards and everything. <clears throat> and the mother and dad look at them and say, well, do you, do you have any idea who did this? Oh, no, I know nothing about this. Why, I would never do that to my mother and father. I've seen them try and tell me the same thing. <laughs> and I know how to tell them, you're the guy. You're not on co uh, on marijuana. You're on cocaine. And you're very foolish that you think because you can fool your parents, you can fool your relatives, you're getting away with it. Everything's going to be okay. Oh, yeah. Like I've said in other videos, there is one power that sits on your shoulder and whispers in your ear and says, don't go there. That's not good for you. Don't do that. You're going to hurt somebody. Don't, don't. And the other side, it says, go ahead. God, it feels good. Look at that. Look how good that feels. Which one are you going to listen to? Which one? Some of you children. I, I have children. That listen to me. Which one are you going to listen to? And one says, oh, listen to your mother and dad. And the other one says, you don't have to listen to nobody. You're your own boss. Oh, but I love Jesus. I go to Sunday school with my mommy and daddy. And my mommy and daddy never taught me a bit. And my Sunday school teacher never taught me a bit how dangerous it is to disobey my parents. Take a good look in, in Romans chapter 1 and see what a reprobate sin is. A reprobate sin is one where God literally looks at you and says, hey, if you want that sin, have at it. He'll let you go. He's not going to fight you. That's your choice, if that's what you want. If you continue to fight him, kick him, destroy everything he's tried to teach you, and you keep determining yourself you're going to have that, just like that drug addict is determined to have his next fix or his next marijuana cigarette just like that alcoholic wants to have his his next drink have at it god's not gonna god's not gonna force you to serve him he's not gonna come in a big deal of intervene and, and spank you good how many people say well you have to go down before you can go up not so some people, they drink because they can't bear the memory of the abuse their life has taken. And they don't know any other way. Because, you know, when they went to church, the pastor never took the time to teach anybody anything. All they did was take a tiny little scripture and preach on it so that they could say, I preached this morning and I'm a preacher. And you get honor and you honor one another and you never teach anybody anything. So that little girl and that little boy that grows up without nothing and they get into the worst sins and their li whole lives are ruined, ruined, who is responsible for that child? Oh, it's all the mother and father's fault. I'm sorry. Not so. Oh, it's, it's their peers' fa fault. They fell into with their peers. Not so. The one who wanted everything. They wanted more parishioners, more money, a bigger church. It's your fault. That's why God is coming to deal with the church first. Judgment begins at the house of God. And if it begins at us, where will the sinner and ungodly appear? You see, because of all the getting that you got, you forgot the responsibility of every soul you picked up. And now some of you have millions. You have millions of people that look up to you. Millions. And you've led them astray as you are. And because you're rich, you got all this money. You've got all this power. You have all this admiration. You know, like Jude says, having men's 
persons in admiration because of advantage? You have a great advantage to get anything you want out of anybody. Why, oh, that's Pastor So-and-so. Oh, my, I just got to meet. Why, that's, that's, uh, Miss, uh, Pastor So-and-so. Oh, look, I got the chills. I got to meet them. And all the while, you are gathering up souls like this, just bringing them in into your church business. Your business, Lord God. Hey, make them give me money. Make them do this. You see, here we go again. Manipulation. These are your prayers. Power of life is in your hands in Christ. You can go and pray for people. You could lay hands on them and they get healed. But you're using yours. It's corrupted. And you're using yours for manipulation. Abracadabra. You're using yours to get more. Well, well, you know what? God tells me I have to have the best. Like the one young lady that told me, well, I get fingernails put on and I get the pedicure I get it all the time, and I have to wear the best of clothes, and I have to have my hair done and buy hundreds of dollars worth of makeup and face cream because I have to be before everybody. That's why I have it done. Why, you you don't have to stand before people. I do. That's why I have everything. I have to look and represent the best. Because, hey, from what prosperity gospel teaches, if you don't have the best, you don't have God. If you don't have everything, you don't, you're, if you're not blessed, you don't have God. Never mind, that is not what the gospel preaches. Jesus even said it. What did you come to see? Somebody in soft clothing, in beautiful clothes? What did you come to see? Somebody that when the wind blows, they go this way and that. What did you come to see? Those people belong in rich men's houses. Jesus didn't have that. I don't know who needs this little talk, but I certainly enjoy the things God gives me. Somebody told me how they laugh because I get so animated. Well, I can't help it. He lays it on my heart. I get it as I see it. And I give it to you, and I'll tell you why, in the hopes with all my heart that you receive the truth, and not that you go and cry and beat yourself up and say, I'm such a horrible person, I'm doing everything that she was talking about, and I don't know what to do. Get out of it. Come out from among them, and be ye a separate people. Get on your knees, in your heart. You don't have to get on your knees physically, but in your heart, get on your knees humbly and say, Lord, like I did. How many years ago? 50 years ago? Probably. When I couldn't stop my tongue from swearing. And I realized positive thinking didn't help me. I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to do this. Trying to tape my mouth shut didn't work. Nothing worked. My mouth was filled with an unruly evil. And out of the abundance of the heart speaketh mouth. And even though I was newly saved, I still didn't have enough to teach me because there was no pastor that ever taught me how to live. The only one that taught me how to live was Jesus Christ. So when I tried to stop, and I, I would go on for a little while and feel so holy and feel so good, I'd go to church and say, wow, this is it, I got God. And I'd go back home, and as soon as somebody crossed me, I'd go blah, 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 blah. I'm telling you, 50 years ago, I was pretty bad. My husband would say, I spent eight hours in a bar. 
I spent eight hours at work, and nobody ever had a fouler mouth than you. He was right. Because I took great pride in being a woman that was able to do anything. And I was going to give you the what for, because my life had been hurt. So when you come along and you gave me a line that you loved me and you and you gave me a line through here and it tried to come through here, <laughs> I'd laugh and I'd give you a bigger line. When I was 15, I learned how to do that. Now, this is all before it got saved. So you would say, well, I want to marry you. And I go, yeah, sure, sure, we'll get married. It's okay. And the next night after he left, I was out. Why? Because I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to to allow my my life to fall down and get beat every day like my mother did my dad until she wound up in a mental institution. I didn't want that to happen to me. So I never wanted to get married. I never wanted any children. Now, you got to understand, I'm 81. I'm talking about 50 years ago, before I got saved. Because I, well, 60 years ago, actually, I never wanted a child because I didn't want to do to that child what was done to me. That's why I would never allow myself to ever hit her in anger, ever. Because the rage of the beatings was too, too, too much in my mind. So anyway, you people that have gone through, and I'm, I'm telling you, the more I talk to people, the more I realize some of them have gone through a lot of things. And you know what they'll tell me? And this is the wonderful part about it. They'll tell me, do you know that everything you're saying to me, God has been talking to me for a long time about? And God has been telling me and showing me that stuff. And I didn't know for sure it was him. I didn't know what direction to go. But now when I hear you, it's so real. And I says, boy, am I glad I did my job. My job is to clarify what God says to you. It is to, it is to make everything come about with you to confirm what God told you. So now you have a direction. Now you know which way to go. Now when you hear it, you oh, that happened to me. Oh, my goodness, I didn't see that. Oh, my goodness, I never thought of it that way. So you may think I'm very foolish, and you may think I have no doctrine, and you may think I don't understand what I'm doing, and you may think that I shouldn't be doing this, that I should be doing it your way under your doctrine and not under what God's using me for. But I know this is my call. I know that you cannot do this, and I know that this is what I am to do. And I'm a scholar. Oh, yeah, I, I've read the Bible and listened to it many, many times. But I didn't do it so that I could have a lot of knowledge and show everybody how smart I am. I'm not here for you. I'm not here for you to approve me. I'm not here for you to accept me. I'm not here for you to pat me on the back, for you to say, well, hey, that's that's real that's good oh my goodness that's I never heard that before I know that's God I don't need it because you see every day of my life every day thank you father thank you Jesus of my life there's that blessed assurance within my soul that I'm doing his will and that I am well pleasing as long as I take out bring out the truth for it is the truth that will set you free it isn't Marion Lynch you don't need me ever you don't need to call me you don't need to contact me 
All you need to do is go before God and believe that he is a rewarder of those that seek after him diligently. Oh, sure, sometimes you might need confirmation. Sometimes because you've been through so much that you just want to hear it from another human being. And guess what happens? God will tell me I'll be 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, and God will say, this one called. I want you to call them. God will wake me up and say, I want you to write this to so-and-so. He won't let me sleep till I write to you. He won't let me sleep until I contact you. He won't let me sleep until I put out a video that you need. Because you see, he loves you, not me. So is that time sometimes I do without sleep. My my head will go to hit that pillow and, it, and it'll go, no, you've got to do this first. This one needs prayer. And that one needs prayer. And that one needs prayer. You can't go till you get this done. So I go and get it done and I'm exhausted. So I am going to be 81. And, and I'll go lay my head on the pillow and they'll go, no. You've got to write this letter. This is very important. Don't concern yourself about what you write. I'll give you the words. Boom, 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 boom. boom. I'm writing the letter. And you see, all the while I'm writing that letter, all the while I'm praying, the presence of God in me is holding back the enemy to keep that person from not being able to hear. So that's the power that's in me of resistance. I don't have to work it up. I don't have to conjure it up. I don't have to beg for it. It's in me. Because you see, when I died to self, along came Jesus and sat on the throne of my heart. That's why I can do what I do. Like I told those preachers when I preached in Mexico. And they studied and studied and studied for hours and prayed and prayed and prayed. And then they went behind the pulpit and the Spirit of God would not move for them. And all the while they're studying, I am doing whatever God led me to do. Physically, I am keeping up with a 47-year-old man, and I'm 68 years old. And yet, the hard work I kept right beside him, doing exactly what God called me to do. Because you see, whatever I did, I didn't do it for him. I didn't do it for that other pastor. I didn't do it for the pastor of the church. I did it for Jesus. So when I went to bed and I could hear them screaming and yelling lies about me to the pastor that I'm saying this, I'm doing it, and I never did, never. And I didn't realize why people hated me so bad. And I'm going to tell you a little secret why. Because when they imagined I was doing evil, they labored against me and it hit them and they blamed me. <laughs> When I found that out, I thought, whoa. <laughs> and so that's why so many hated me, because what they were doing was coming back on them. And they had to learn what I learned. They had to go where I went. Because you see, I had to learn that too when I was really, really young. I had to understand that too. Don't ever get angry with anybody. Don't ever wait for them to pay. Don't ever think for one minute they're going to pay. Because that is none of your business. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Now you can forgive someone and never let them back into your life. You do not have to let them back. Because if they betrayed you once, they may betray you again and God don't want it. So it's not a matter of you being angry with them or holding it. It's a matter of using wisdom. If you're going to knock me down and tramp on me, and you did it once and you did a real good job, I'm certainly not going to want you back in my life. There's a scripture in there that says, let them return to you, but don't you return to them that the Lord restored that which he took not away. When you let them return to you, it's because you're restoring what you didn't do wrong. And you didn't take it away. 
but you restore it for their sake. So you let them come back because you love them, because Jesus died for them, because he loves them. But I won't take a chance for you to hurt me the second time. I don't take a chance for you to get in on it and hurt me the third time. You know why? I refuse to be tangled up in this life doing wrong, that life doing me harm. I won't walk there. I won't do those things. You see? Why? Because there's so many out there that need help. Why would I want to entangle with you? A good soldier doesn't get entangled in this life. The foolishness of literally sitting there, well, I put on the whole armor of God. I put the helmet of salvation. I've got my shield of faith. I've got my my feet shod with the gospel peace. I'm ready. I've faced my day. Well, you know, if you're such a baby that you have to put on toys that have no meaning, go ahead, have at it. But you see, a real Christian knows their mind has a covering of Jesus Christ. That's their helmet. Their mind knows that he covers their eyes. He covers their mind. He covers everything. You have the helmet of salvation. I belong to Jesus, and I'm getting into heaven. You have the breastplate of righteousness because Jesus inside of me is my righteousness and he always does what is right. Not sometimes, not a little bit, but always. And if he isn't always doing right, you don't have enough of him. And the shield of faith, it automatically comes up. I don't have to pretend I have one. I don't have to envision I have one. I don't have to imagine I have one. I never use my imagination or envisioning because it's not of God. I don't have to. My God is real. How about yours?